And this year, we're focusing on health issues in the community, which many of you know, and it's a community development and health course that has been run for the past 20 years. So the conference spans two days. We've got, we've got the opening session this morning, and then we've got a series of workshops, which I think many of you have already signed up for, which are based around health issues in the community. And they're there, the workshops are gonna help people to explore a community development approach to health and what this means for their work in a number of different ways. So this morning, just in this next hour and a half, we wanted to get you all together um, and to, I suppose, talk a bit more about health issues in the community and to hear from a couple of um, keynote speakers. So in a moment, I'm going to, just to do an exercise to, to find out a bit more who's here, about who's here, we're going to do a quick kind of icebreaker exercise. And um, that's a bit of a challenge with the number of people we've got in the room, but we've, we've found a way of doing that. So we're going to try that out. And then um, I'm going to introduce the keynote speakers who are Dr. Matt Lowther, who's the head of place and equity at Public Health Scotland, and Jane Jones, who's the author of Health Issues in the Community and Private Troubles, Public Issues. But before that, I want to introduce Dr. Matt Lowther, who is head of place and equity at Public Health Scotland. And he's gonna talk about their new three-year strategy and what this means for Public Health Scotland, their partners and communities. So thank you and welcome to Matt. Thanks, Joe. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll just try and share my screen. Can everyone um, see that? Can someone give me a shout? Yeah. Joe, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, everyone can see it. Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, morning, everyone. Um, many thanks for the um, invitation um, to, to come along and, and talk to you. Um, as Joe said, I'm Matt Lowther, I'm the Head of Police and Equity at um, Public Health Scotland. Um, and as I'll be touching on um, just in the presentation, um, we see communities um, as being absolutely integral to um, public health. Um, so it's, you know, it, it really is a privilege to come along and, and, and talk to you guys. And as Joe said, we've been a, a supporter of SEDC and Checks for a number of years, and hopefully that will continue. Um, also, want to say just, and I'm really sorry, I, I can't stay for, for longer. Um, but we've got um, a few members of the team on the call and, and uh, uh, participate in the conference right in a couple of days. So I'm sure they'll be able to contribute um, from a public health perspective. Um, so yeah, but yeah, apologies, I can't stay for longer. I, I hope the the, the 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 event goes really well. Okay. Um, so um, I was asked to say a bit about um, public health um, generally and public health Scotland. Um, and apologies for um, those of you who already know all of this. I know there will be some people on the call who have been quite close to the process of um, the public health review over the last sort of five, four or five years. But for those who are not aware, um, Scotland um, has been going through a fairly significant review of public health that started way back in 2015 with the Public Health Review. Um, and I guess the reason why um, public health um, is going through this, this review process and continues to go through this review process was because I guess the government at the time recognised that Scotland is and was facing these significant public health challenges. Um, and again, I'm sure the audience is, is well aware of, of what these challenges are, so I won't um, dwell on them in detail, but you'll know that Scotland has some of the widest health inequalities in the Western world. So health inequalities, uh, the unfair and avoidable differences in health outcomes across um, different groups. As I say, unfortunately, Scotland has some of the widest health inequalities. Um, life experience. Expectancy, despite um, huge increases over the last 100 years or so, in the last five, six years, we start to see a stalling of that life expectancy. You may have seen that on the news a few years ago. It was um, fairly um, headline news, but we st really start to see that levelling off and that stalling of, of life expectancy. So that's obviously a concern. Um, I think there was uh, and is a recognition that our health and social care services are, are under a considerable pressure. Um, and so I think we need to 
Um, and I think the, the government, particularly conscious of this, we need to think about how we stop people getting sick and how we try and keep people out of the health and social care system for as long as we can. And that's that's a, a challenge, a role for public health. We've obviously got the, the, the global climate emergency that has huge public health challenges. So these were all of the things that were bubbling along uh, or bubbling, bubbling around at the time of the public health review. And of course, now we've um, had COVID um, to, to deal with. So, you know, I think the, the world still are a huge range of, of public health challenges that, that Scotland needs to deal with. So that was a reason and other reasons why the government was looking at the, the whole public health system and thinking about, you know, is it really um, set up in the best way to, to meet these challenges? Um, so I, I, I won't bore you with all the detail of all the recommendations that were um, in the, the public health review, but I, I guess it was just three key ones. So you can see them there, focused on the whole system working, establishing of some new public health priorities and the creation of a new public health body. And I'll say a wee bit about each of them. Um, so the first one, focusing on health um, on the whole system. Um, well, again, it was interesting when Jo was just talking about health issues in the community, she, she touched on some of this. So again, those of you who have been through the programme will, will know all of this. Um, but, you know, we, I suppose we recognise now in public health um, that um, health care in the NHS is not the main determinant of, of, of our health. And it's an it's important part, but the drivers of, of, of health and poor health lay way outside the health service and, um, and healthcare and lay in what we call the social and economic determinants of health. They're really the big things that drive health. And of course, as I say, they sit way outside um, the NHS. Um, and again, those of you going uh, been through might have come across this. This is just a, a classic diagram that's used all the time. And, in public health um, and really what it does is just kind of encapsulate what I was talking about so you know, what drives health is a whole um, multitude of different things you know it's almost these different layers so there's some individual determinants you know such as your, your, your lifestyle your age your genetic factors there's a range of social and, and community determinants and then there's a, a, a wider range of social economic and cultural determinants and I guess what public health and health improvement has tended to focus on 10, 15 years ago was very much just the individual lifestyle factors. So things like physical activity, alcohol, diet, drugs, etc. All of those, of course, are very important, but we kind of almost excluded these wider, um, these wider drivers. I think we've kind of flipped now. Um, so we absolutely recognise that the really key drivers of poor health um, are these wider um, determinants. So now we're much more interested as a public health community on these wider determinants. The, the lifestyle factors, of course, are still important, but the, the whole idea is we need to work across all of these things, the whole system. Um, and that's really what that, that recommendation of the Public Health Review was, trying to work across the whole system, across all of these different factors. Because so those obviously are important for the health, <coughs> they're also critical for, for health inequalities. So if you take any of those, um, any of those drivers, um, and I've just chosen healthcare services as one or access to healthcare services, we see a huge inequality in each of these things and all of these things. So if you look there, that graph, <coughs> excuse me, um, demonstrates this classic thing we call the inverse care law. And really what that says is that people who need the most um, care have got the least access to that care. So you can see the most affluent um, communities on the left, most de deprived communities on the right. Um, the black line is basically the, the funding per patient register. And you can see that uh, it's fairly equal across all of the deprivation groups, but the actual um, the requirement is much, much greater in the most deprived areas. They're the ones that need the, the most amount of care, but you can see that the care is actually equally spread, or if anything, it's more spread across the most affluent groups. So this is just an example um, of you know, the, 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 the classic inequality across these um, social, economic and environmental drivers of, of poor health. And that's what we're trying to do in this whole system, public health whole system, is work across all of these things. 
Um, second um, major recommendation was around um, creation of um, some new public health priorities for Scotland. And again, apologies for my have the time to go into the detail of all of this. But over the last, um, well, I guess about two years ago, we got together um, a whole range of different groups, organisations across Scotland, looked at all the evidence around public health, um, debated it, um, and eventually settled on these six public health priorities. So these are Scotland's public health priorities. They're not necessarily priorities for the public health system. They are Scotland's public health priorities. Um, you can see them there and, you know, they're, I guess, just reflecting on what I was talking about before, they're just a mix really of, of all of those, those layers of the onion. So, of course, yes, we still are interested in the, um, the lifestyle factors such as alcohol, alcohol tobacco, drugs, etc. But we're much more interested as well about um, the wider determinants. So where we live, how we live, you know, poverty, whether we have a job, etc., etc. Um, and then the third key recommendation coming out of the Public Health Review is the creation of um, a new national agency. So this is Public Health Scotland. Um, so this came into being um, last year. I mean, uh, spookily almost, uh, almost at, at, at the same time as COVID hit. So the last year for us, as, as you can imagine, has been a pretty, um, pretty significant challenge trying to create a new organisation by bringing three separate organisations together to create a new organisation at the same time as having to deal with the biggest public health issue that Scotland's faced in you know, in decades. So the last year has, has been a bit of a challenge, as, as, as I guess it's been for, for all of us. Anyway, Public Health Scotland brought together three these three national organisations. So Health Scotland that focused on health improvement, health protection that focused on health protection, an ISD that I guess focused on stats and um, the, the public health, um, uh, I suppose, data. Um, and public Health Scotland brought all of these organisations together and that's really just how we're kind of structured and our, our, um, our, our directorates. And again, I don't have time to go into the detail of that. The key thing really here for me is that um, we are still a national NHS body, part of the NHS family but we're now jointly accountable to both government and to COSLA. And that joint accountability to COSLA is the critical bit because that, again, goes back to what I was saying about us now being, or trying to work across the whole system and a, recognize, a recognition that um, a lot of the things that I was talking about that drive health actually sit within local authorities and sit within um, health and social care partnerships and you know, are driven by... Um, the third sector and our, our local community. So we have to get much better at, at working across that whole system. Um, so uh, again, this is just our strategic plan, just at a glance that was launched um, a couple of months ago. Um, I, I, I won't go through in, in detail, but I mean, hopefully you can see who we are and what we're about. So we want to be national and local. We want to be collaborative, outcomes focused, evidence informed want to be collaborative, excellent, innovative, respectful. And um, I suppose the, the, the key thing for me is where we've chosen our areas of focus. And of course, we will still work across the, 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 the public health priorities. That's part of our function. But we specific, particularly want to focus on, on these things. So obviously COVID, but mental health, community in place and poverty and, and children because we think that they are the particular things that are really going to have the, the biggest impact. Um, and, uh, and how are we going to be successful? Well, we'll know be, we'll, if we're successful, if we are successful in terms of working alongside communities, um, and we'll get feedback from our, our, our partners as to whether we're able to do that. Um, I just wanted to highlight, um, again, apologies, I don't have the time to, to, to go into the detail, but if you read our strategic plan, you'll see that working alongside and with communities is actually writ large right throughout the right throughout the plan. Why is that? Well, as I've said, you know, it is one of Scotland's public health priorities. It was as touched on, it's fundamental, fundamental to, to both good health and to, to health inequalities. But I think um, we're absolutely recognising now as an organisation, I think as a, as a public health profession, as a system, that there is, and you know, I don't need to talk to this audience about this, just about how much un untapped potential there is out there 
in our communities and we just have to get much better at working with them alongside them and supporting them. Um, and I think the last year around COVID has, has just demonstrated to that fantastically just how well the communities have responded to that COVID challenge and how you know they've fantastically come together. Um, I know there's been lots of research looking at how communities have, have come together to, to respond to COVID. This is just one um, one bit that um, I've been involved in or, or, or I'm aware of. And again, lots of people on the call will, I'm sure, have, have, have seen this. So this is from work led by Nesta um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Um, so they looked, spoke to a range of, of communities and, and organisations to try and get a sense of how they've come together around COVID. Um, I, I, you know, I, I won't try and attempt to, to summarise. Um, and again, this, I guess, will be reflective of lots of the research that, that's, that's been done. But you can see that they absolutely, you know, and, and again, this won't be a um, uh, headline used to this audience because you guys will know this, but, you know, really finding that communities, you know, are, you know, the right people because they have, got all those relationships already in place and um, you know community organizations can you know rapidly respond and uh, uh, reflect uh, are flexible and can really mobilize that local community response and um, far better than any sort of public agency um, can do so um it's probably if you if you weren't aware of it there's there, there is another and um, there is a session on tomorrow that's probably too um, too late to, to to get involved, but I suppose I just wanted to flag it up as as um, something that I knew was, that, that was that was um, ongoing, and and I guess just if you're interested, you know, to to make those connections. Um, so really, I'd, I'll I'll finish there. Yeah, I mean, hopefully that's given at least given me a sense of what Public Health Scotland is about, what we're trying to do as an organisation, where we want to get to, um, and why. Um, and as I say, I, I'm so sorry I can't stay for the questions, but you know, please um, email me questions or or any comments you have, um, stick them in the chat and I'll take them away and try and respond to them all. And as I said, we've got um, colleagues from um, my own team on the call throughout the, the couple of days, so I'm sure they'll be able to pick up some of the issues as well. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. That was really interesting and useful presentation. And I can see a few claps in the in the um, people using the symbols of claps. So people are obviously getting a lot out of that. Okay, I'm now going to go on to Jane. Now, we're very lucky to have Matt here. And we're really lucky to have Jane here because Jane is the original author and driving force behind health issues in the community. Um, and she's also the author of Private Troubles on Public Issues. So what she didn't know about this area of work, I think, is probably not worth knowing. But she's really interested to hear all of you today as well and to hear about your experience, I think, of using health issues in the community. So she's also the founder of Pilton Community Health Project. And Jane's going to speak to us um, now for a few minutes about health issues in the community and where it came from. And then we're going to have a short video of health issues in the community participants um, talking about what they learned from their communities and then Jane's going to comment on that as well before we go into the small groups. So Jane, it's great to have you here with us. Welcome. Hello, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to get the um, the, the right. right. Um, thank you very much for inviting me actually. It's lovely, lovely to be here. And as you can imagine, having been around for so long, um, it's slightly dreamlike how, how something that I wrote actually last century, I quite like saying that, 1997, um, is still alive and kicking. And um, it was this very, very, um, well, a bit of serendipity, actually, that how I met up with, with, with Kate recently and, and talked about what has been happening, because we hope to write something about it. And also to the tutors, who are just so lovely, committed, and, and a creative lot that I met, which is very inspiring. And of course, to read some of the students' writing, which I always find just very moving and, and wonderful. So it's a really great pleasure to be here. So thanks for, for inviting me. I've been asked to say a little bit yeah, about the backstory of, of HIC, um, how it came about, and what kind of influenced it, um, and perhaps a little bit about where it sits today. Um, so as Joe indicated, I 
it really started in the in the Pilton Community Health Project, which is where I was working in, in North Edinburgh, 1980s to 1990s. Um, and I think the starting point in HIC really is the question we were trying to work with then, which is kind of who defines health issues? You know, because who def how they're defined obviously then helps how you think about how to solve them. And this all came out through, through the work we were doing. So I'd like to talk about perhaps two major influences on the, on the writing of the pack. A um, bit of history here, actually. So a bit of a um, magical mystery history tour kind of thing. So the bit, a bit going back um, was really that the first huge influence, if you like, the backcloth to where we were, how we were working, was in 1980, a long, long time ago, um, the Black Report came out. Now, this was a, a report written by Sir Douglas Black, where he was a chair of this group. Uh, and it was an in-depth scientific study showing that, uh, as we were talking, actually Matt was talking earlier, about the huge inequalities in health that were, were around in the 70s and 80s, and the impact of income and social class on people's health, and also the unequal access to health services, actually. Um, and very interesting, again, it, it recommended lots of um, uh, social economic things, like increasing child benefit, improving housing, agreeing minimum working conditions with the unions. And this, this um, report was updated about seven years later, but of course we're talking about 1980 and the Thatcher government had just come into power and they really didn't want to know about these reports on this research. In fact, they tried to suppress them. It's quite a long story, which some of you might know about, but the Black Report, for example, was produced as, as a photocopied version. This is a government report <laughs> that usually come out, as you know, in very flashy, um, and the booklets, and this came out photocopied, 260 copies for the whole of the UK. So um, it was and, and on a bank holiday Monday or something. So they didn't really want this to get out. And of course, because they didn't, um, a lot of people did want to know about it. So there was a kind of underground activity at the time of researchers and activists trying to kind of get hold of this information. Um, but the government policy of the day, of course, was not, it wasn't official policy. So these are the kind of streams running when I started working in Pilton. And initially, um, I was a single worker based in a, in a GP practice. And because of this kind of, if you like, dominant view, the dominant narrative, we'd call it today, um, the GPs, of course, thought that um, I would be coming to help them in their work. So I would go out and get people to come in for immunization or encourage people to stop smoking and so on. And the, the poor health visitors, of course, whose job, job is community health, uh, were thinking like, who is this woman who keeps, you know, wandering around talking to people in a laundrette and calls herself a community health worker? So a lot of tensions in there, really. And I didn't really help because there was no roadmap. I didn't quite know what I was doing either, because community development and health was relatively new. So it was a bit of a guddle and, and, and quite a complicated setting, really. But one of the first things I do remember um, noting, and I, and I think I have written before about this, so sorry if you've heard this story, but it really crystallized for me what was going on with this whole notion of the, I say, the dominant official view. I was speaking to some tenants in a high rise block and one of these awful, I think it was 60s block actually, um, you know, I think 13 stories, you know, uh, poor, um, poor structure, windows didn't fit, the walls were thin. Um, the tenants told me that their kids were always getting cold because of the dampness. Um, and then they couldn't get their, their immunizations. The doctors didn't like coming there because it was seen as a, a rough old place. Um, the lift didn't work, uh, the intercom didn't work. And one woman said when the doctor did come, she had to kind of hang out of a six floor balcony to watch for him to come or her to come and then shout, you know, and then come down and then let him in and all this stuff. So it was absolutely an awful kind of um, uh, list, if you like, of, of, of dreadful conditions. And at the end of this long um, discussion we had, I was making notes and I said, gosh, there's a lot of health issues here. And I can remember even today, there was a kind of stunned silence and the women kind of looked, what's she talking about, you know? And then one of them said, um, oh, you mean about my smoking? And I said, no, not about your smoking, about uh, all these things you've talked to me about, which are, which are really important. Um, now, in fact, we went on and had we, we did get involved with the dampness campaign and joined up with the tenants in Easter House and so on. But it was that very interesting, um, you know, moment for me to realise that because the conditions or the or the, the idea that those um, conditions were causing ill health were not to be found in the public kind of domain, you know, it wasn't in the news, it wasn't in the papers, 
um, people found it hard to talk about. And I'm sure at some level, obviously, those women probably chatted to each other and said, actually, this dampness is, is, is giving our kids, you know, colds and stuff. They're not daft. But there's nowhere to kind of put that. And that was a really powerful moment to realize how to break through that kind of dominant, if you like, view that we get um, in order to kind of make, improve things. And of course, a dominant view, as it were, isn't, isn't um, always bad. I mean, it's how, how most countries and societies work. You know, you have a, a particular ideology or a particular view of the world. But I think it's only when that particular view causes suffering and causes um, ill health or causes all kinds of um, uh, horrible things that you need to kind of challenge it. So that was the first thing. Um, and then luckily for me, um, because I was just trying to work out how one would work with this social model of health, as we've just talked about, there was a marvelous project in, in um, Edinburgh called the Adult Learning Project, who were looking at the ideas of Paolo Freire, this lovely man who I, I'm completely in love with Paolo Freire. He's dead, but <laughs> actually I just discovered recently that he died in 1997, which was when the pack was first written, which is rather lovely. Somebody said to me, you know, his, his ideas are kind of rippling through. And of course, through, through Hick and Checks, it's, I think he's still alive, which is very nice. But he was um, a very interesting adult educator, philosopher, writer, who was working with landless peasants in South America, in Brazil. Um, he worked in a lot of Africa, a lot of African health programs, actually, that are based on his work. So how on earth could the way he was working fit with a kind of urban, you know, industrial Scotland? Uh, so this project was trying to help us all um, think about his ideas and what we could do with them, because it was quite complicated. His book was translated from Portuguese into, into English, and it was torturous. I don't know if every, I've, I've still got a copy, actually, I'm very fond of this, but, you know, Pedagogy of the Oppressed is not a kind of nice weekend read. Quite difficult, really. <laughs> but um, within that, we knew there were these kind of golden nuggets, uh, and just a few things, actually, that, that, that I'd, I'll draw from him. Because what we found in Pilton was, whether we were working with quite, you know, difficult, distressing, like intimate issues, like mental health, or public campaigns to save our casualty services, his method and his approach still worked, I think. It was just like a real gem. So, for example, he talks about things like, um, and, and it, it's, the way, it's the way he thinks, which I love. He, he talks about naming the world, naming the world yourself. You know, and his thing was about education shouldn't be seen as some clever people have it and they pour it into your kind of empty brains. Um, we, we, are, we are creative, intelligent people. Everybody is. Um, and we can think as well. So you have to start naming the world yourself as you're experiencing it. Um, the, other, the other word he had, which we struggled over, was conscientization or something, which I can't even say now. But basically, um, it's about developing critical consciousness, which is another mouthful. Um, that really means to me thinking outside the box, because the box is constrained by what I've been talking about, you know, this kind of dominant view. So it's really encouraging people to, to think more broadly about what's happening in front of them. And in fact, I'm really pleased the, um, the South Lanarkshire superstars are here because one of you in the video, I think it was Linda, said it beautifully, much better than all this jargon. She said, it's not just your backyard. The community is the whole world. And that's lovely. So it's a, it's a lovely sentence that just actually captures what we're talking about here. Uh, and so this kind of thing is quite complicated. It's like the work being done in West Fife about food banks. You know, it's become kind of normalized, hasn't it? Even though we're probably uncomfortable about it. But we don't quite know how to how to kind of get through to the other side of that. You know, how in the 21st century are people having to get coupons to go for food we're giving away? I mean, it's all all these kind of contradictory ideas that really we try to somehow need the words to find our way through to them. And lastly, the other wee bit I love about him was about dialogue. Freire was a real humanist. You know, he wasn't a kind of some people saw him as a he got involved with liberation the, theological stuff, I think, in, in Africa, but he wasn't um you know, a, a guy to get to the barricades and throw Molotov cocktails at the government or something. He was very much about seeing everybody as, as a human being and in creating dialogue with even people in authority or people that had power. We have to try and develop that on a kind of equal level. That was quite important to him. So we really have to listen to each other in, 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 thinking, our, in thinking about the issues we're talking about. So the way that, um, you know, some of the hit groups like Dundee Group and so on have made a play and they're taking that dialogue out into the community or a film or a presentation. It kind of widens what he would call the dialogue. Anyway, uh, that's Freire, and, and I could go on about Freire because I say I do love him, but um, once the pack was finished, finally, 
um, we got funding from Health Education Board of Scotland and, and I was working at Murray House then. And there were a few hiccups with this actually. It's quite interesting really, because it's again the timing of things, you know, and politics of the moment. Because the final copy met with a bit of nervousness from this group and there were a lot of difficult meetings so they kept wanting to take things out and I kept wanting to have them in and they would put them out and we had this little kind of battle going on. Um, and then I think what happened, one of them, for example, I found quite amusing really, was um, about uh, a poem by Liz Lockhead. I don't know if any of you know it, but I, I like Liz Lockhead. And it was a poem called Condensation from her, I think it's Tartan Music uh, book. And basically she had captured what tenants were, were then talking about, especially in Glasgow, about condensation and dampness, you know, dampness being called condensation. Of course, that meant it was the tenant's fault. So she had this lovely poem about it. But I think there was one of the lines about um, the Tory government or something. And so the Health Education Board of Scotland were very nervous about this and just did not want it in. They felt it would be too tricky because we were just coming up to another election. You can imagine 1997, the end of the, the Conservative government period. And there was all this stuff going on. So anyway, somebody told me I should just put my name on it as copyright and then they couldn't change it. So I think we did that and it went in. But it just shows you the kind of tensions that go on, I think, about um, uh, what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So that was really how the pack developed. And then coming to see, you know, where it is today um, and all the offshoots um, and finding a lovely kind of adoptive family in Czechs um, who have really looked after it and dusted it down a bit and updated it. You know, I had people going to libraries, I think, which <laughs> dates me. Um, so it really needed that and a really good um, research element to it. It's just marvellous to see it. And it's been a really, really great pleasure, actually, to, to be involved again. Um, so in some ways, the whole life of it and the story of it, it does feel a bit like a kind of hick family to me. Um, and I think in, a, in just now we're going, to, we're going to go on and I'm going to finish at this point and we're going to hear from some other others of the Hick family through a wee video that I think Sarah Jane's going to, to show us now. So thank you very much. I live in Inverkeeding. It is a reasonably sized borough with retail, hairdressers, pubs and a few other industries. I have tried to find actual unemployment figures just from my area, but have been unable to access that information. Although I have been able to find Fife, Scotland and Great Britain, this lack of information keeps us from being unable to challenge inequalities. Unless people know about a problem, they don't understand it as an issue. They might just see it as a one-off kind of thing and not realise the extent of it. With no figures to back it up, it can be easily ignored and no one will be held accountable. I know a few families that have suffered from generational poverty and so, as well as from my research, I have seen firsthand how the lives of these people are and how they struggle to survive. What part two has done for me as an individual? I have gained more knowledge with regards to how much poverty can have a detrimental effect on not only an individual, but as a whole on communities. I was unaware of services depleting and many people suffering from all the cuts that have been made by the government's cutbacks. I just never realised that different parts of the city were actually a lot worse than I ever thought. Doing all this research has opened my eyes and opinions. When I started HIC, I hadn't found my voice until I found inspiration from this group. Holiday hunger was a subject that came up as an important issue. We discovered that low income and school holidays was the most talked about issue, which caused poverty within people's home lives. The extra days of school holidays to cover with no change to income was financially having a ne negative impact on families. Easter, Christmas and summer holidays were not enjoyable and even the in-service days at school added more pressure, which in turn caused families to struggle. A quote from the local community, Sometimes as a parent, I dread the summer holidays, when these are the times we should cherish the extra times with our children. So, our project was let's make a difference, stop child poverty, and let's feed our wings. 
progress with this, we thought about different, different ways of thinking about health, poverty and inequalities, while also focusing on participation and power and bringing these topics into our group project. Our hit group wrote a short play about self-harm and suicide called She Died Waiting. This was a powerful message to let people know that services need urgently updated. People in need should know exactly where to go for information and assistance appertaining to them. On reflection of the impact our short drama had on our family, friends and the wider community, we each felt we had gained a lot of confidence. We began to realise that people were listening as we were being invited to perform at more venues. The audiences were always different. We were reaching more and more people who were willing to listen. We felt empowered and confident that we could help to make change, that we decided to look to our local areas. Every performance prompted a spontaneous discussion as everyone could relate to the story. It was an enlightening as well as a heartbreaking discovery. For although when we wrote the script, it was not based on any person, it was based on parts of our life experiences. It suddenly became everyone's story, a story everyone could re relate to. Okay, should I just carry on, Joe? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a few words because, again, I always feel very moved actually listening to people's voices and actually reading what people say. And as the last speaker said, um, sometimes you, you, you have a resonance because it's everybody's story. And I think the COVID experience is one of obviously the worst health issues we've had in most of our living memories. And it is everybody's story. So I think I just wanted to suggest that I'm really um, very excited actually about Public Health Scotland coming together because in a way for me it, it kind of um, it's a bit like we've been here before you know back in the 80s about about the social and economic influences of our health and the whole importance of looking upstream you know not just what happens to people at the, at the end of this awful time so um, one of the things that I, I looked at in the Public Health Scotland agenda which is to do with sustainable inclusive economy we're delighted to see that they're going to be looking at working security and conditions at social security policies and bold radical ideas like citizens basic income which for me actually is an absolutely really exciting bold idea i think it should be like a nhs of the 1946 because this would just you know just anyway i'm a real fan of, of, of um, citizens basic income but those kind of ideas are very um um important and, I, and, and I'm, I'm delighted they're in the mix now and one thing I was thinking was about how HIC um, and the network of HIC the students and the tutors could maybe feed into some of this thinking because um, uh, obviously um, Matt has said very much that they want to work with communities and, that, and I think that's very very important and one thing we have in Scotland that I'm sure many of you know is that we had some devolved um, social security benefits in 2016. We have 11 benefits now that Scotland deals with. And Jean Freeman, the health minister, when she was setting that new system up, had a brilliant creative idea. She actually constructed, or she constructed, she, she um, developed a panel. Uh, she called it the experience panel of, I think it was almost 2000 volunteers, all of whom were, had, had experience or were in receipt of benefits themselves. And she used this panel to feed in and to have like a sounding board for developing the social security system we're developing in Scotland, which is much less punitive, to be honest, than the English one and about more dignity, you know, and people's right to have benefits. So she used this knowledge in the community, real knowledge, to feed into her developing strategy. And I was just thinking the other day, it would be marvellous if the HIC network of, as I say, students and, and tutors could somehow offer the same input into Public Health Scotland's development because it's not just a kind of random lot of citizens you know you've got people who are mostly i would say from um the areas that have been experiencing you know post-industrial times and and having a really grim time of it the last um, well last many years um and the people have also been considering health issues thinking about them critically you know writing about them this is an experienced lot of people here we're talking about so it's a body of experience and knowledge 
that I think personally is just as necessary really as academic research or medical expertise and that this could be tapped and utilised by perhaps having a similar kind of panel that would feed into Public Health Scotland. So that's a bit of a, you know, throwing down the gauntlet, but why not? And it would be nice to talk about it sometime, even if we can't cover it today. So I just would like to finish there and, and thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Jane, for that really inspiring presentation. And, and also, I suppose, um, yeah, for, for talking to us about the roots of HIC um, and where it comes from and how relevant it is today, as well as what collective impact we can make as people who are involved and, and really um, in touch with the issues um, that HIC raises as well.